But I've definitely found that when I train fasted, it's, it's changed my body. Like I, people often ask me like, what's one tip that you can give? Like one tip, and it's always my one tip to anyone, keto, intermittent faster, whatever or not, is train in a fasted state. Like I get the most metabolic response when I train in a fasted state. Um, to the point now where I think I'm so fat adapted to that that I actually feel sluggish when I train in a non-fasted state. My body feels out of whack. It's kind of like, it, sometimes to a detriment, right? Because sometimes like I actually feel a little bit sluggish after I eat anything. It's like my body just prefers to be in that really clean mm -hmm. um, fat adaptation state. But there's also so much cool science. Hey friends, welcome back. We're in Los Angeles here with my buddy Thomas DeLauer and we're gonna talk all about training, fasted training, hypertrophy, fat loss. Cause Thomas, you've been in the fitness industry for a long time now, right? I mean, yeah. 20 years? <laughs> not, not since I was 10, but no, no it's, uh, I've been in the industry for like good eight, nine years now. Mm -hmm. So you know a lot about different strategies. I mean, you follow primarily like intermittent fasting and ketosis is kind of your bread and butter, yeah. but you carb cycle as well, would you say? Yeah, or? I wouldn't necessarily call it carb cycling, but I mean, I do more of what I would call a targeted ketogenic where like I apply carbs at specific times, but like carb cycling, I see a little bit more as like having one specific day with carbs. Maybe that's, maybe that's incorrect, but that's how I always see carb cycling. So sure. I, I play with carbs, I go through phases. So I go through you know phases where I'll be a little bit more ketogenic and phases where I focus on just low glycemic carbs and kind of mess around with it. I'm at a point now where I just like to have fun with it. That's awesome. Yeah. And so when would you do like more of a ketogenic style phase? Like, because are you still doing figure shoots and photo shoots and things like that or? Not really, unless it's associated with my own like personal brand, you yeah. know, then, then I will. But you know, I'm not doing a whole lot in the way of magazine shoots anymore. They call me every now and then. Sometimes it's fun to do it just, just for kicks and just yeah. to get some great footage and stuff like that. It's always fun to you know, bring my team behind the scenes and like be able to get some cool footage for that. But I would usually use a ketogenic diet when I, predominantly I'm like needing very high levels of like cognitive function. So if I know that I'm going through a sprint in my business where I need to be able to handle stress a little bit more, like going through acquisitions or anything like that, like I will go keto just because I feel like I, I feel like I handle stress better when I'm keto. I feel like I'm less jumpy, less reactive. Maybe that's just my perception, but also like if I'm doing more in the way of like endurance work, so mm -hmm. more in the way of aerobic work, if I know that I'm gonna be uh, training for a half marathon or anything like that, I'll definitely shift into more of a keto phase where I'm strict keto. Uh, but if I'm doing something where I'm just trying to maintain a specific look, where I'm trying to stay lean, that's when I'll go more targeted keto, where I'll just apply keto for the most part, add carbs as a kind of a backloading system after a workout, just to maintain glycogen a little bit more and stay full, but so many different ways that I go about it. Thomas, that's amazing. You know, one of the things that I've found with people, there's so many questions about carb cycling, like how much carb should I have in the post-workout window um, based upon like exercise intensity, duration, how fit they are. Do you have any general rules or recommendations for people if they've been keto for a while, they're fat adapted, mm -hmm. but they want to start hitting the weights a little bit harder maybe yeah. um, about how much carbs they should have and timing of those? Yeah, totally. So, I mean, I do want to kind of lead off with the fact that like the whole well, you know this, the protein, protein synthesis stays elevated for a good 24 hours after a good workout. Right. Like this whole, the whole anabolic window of like 30 minutes, it's not that much more extreme at the first 30 minutes to 60 minutes than it is even 12 hours later. So like you have so many other enzymatic processes that are going on that are putting you in that quote unquote anabolic stage as long as the workout was hard enough to actually elicit that response. So it's not as important, but what does happen after a workout is of course your insulin sensitivity. So if you are going to consume some carbs, it is a good time because you have a higher likelihood of them actually just getting shuttled into glycogen versus you know being burned immediately. So it's a little bit safer there. But you know, I'm a big fan of sort of that, uh, you're familiar with like the sodium gated channels and how like certain channels that will open with, um, with the fructose, certain channels will open with glucose and a little bit of salt and all that stuff. So that's kind of how I play with targeted ketos, like mm. a small amount of fructose, like 15 grams of fructose, 15, 20 grams of glucose, and a little bit of salt to make sure that it's basically like making my own healthy Gatorade and really for lack of a better term, right? That's awesome. It's, so that's something that I'll do and I'll only really do that on my most intense workouts because I think my body is so fat adapted that I'm in a pretty glycogen sparing state. Mm -hmm. You know, as you know from your research too, is that like when you're on a ketogenic diet, your body becomes very efficient at storing glycogen. It actually gets, it doesn't, it needs less of it because you start using fat for your lower intensity activity that you ordinarily might use some of your glycogen for. So it's like preserves it pretty well. So I don't feel like I need to reload a ton of glycogen. Mm -hmm. Amazing. So with that workout or that recipe, that uh, glucose, salt, fructose mixture mm -hmm. that you were talking about, 
Would that be after a HIIT workout or more hypertrophy-based training or power training? Yeah, that's a good question. So it all depends on what my goals are at that point in time. Mm -hmm. So like right now, I don't do a ton of hypertrophy training. So it's usually, for me, it's recovery after more of a HIIT workout. But if I'm in more of a hypertrophy mode, that's a great time to backload because of course you actually allow that you know that you allow that process to actually occur and actually potentially help you build more muscle. You know, you're kind of flipping that switch. Mm -hmm. You know, we know that spiking your insulin a little bit is going to activate that mTOR pathway a little bit more too, which is very anabolic. So, if you couple that with the right calories, you couple that with the right timing, then of course you're giving yourself a recipe to build some muscle. Yeah, amazing. Um, now, what about cardio for fat loss? For like, well, first of all, do you believe in targeted fat loss? I know some people are like, dude, I just got to get this little bit of belly fat off. Like. Is there any specific ways that you found for targeted fat loss? Because there are some creams out there, there's like some gels that are thermogenic based. What would you say to that? Yeah, it's the gels and the creams I'm a little bit sketched on. I don't know if those really, really work. Mm -hmm. um, there's only been one real study that I actually found, and actually one of my guys on my team, Matt, found it, and it was like finding that there's a correlation with spot reduction when associated with specific kinds of fasting. I can't remember the study specifically, so I can link to it down in the description when we find it. Sure. But it's, I just remember it from about a year ago. It was like, that was like the one link we could find with like spot reduction was like when in an intermittent fasting state, there were some studies that showed like specifically with leg fat, like it was able to burn more fat when they actually exercised specifically their legs versus like an arm ergometer when uh, they were in a fasting state. Interesting. So that's about my degree of spot reduction. But when yeah. it comes down to the belly fat or anything like that, I don't, I personally don't think that you can sit there and do a bunch of crunches and burn mm -hmm. more fat, but I do think that, of course, you know, by bulking up certain areas with muscle, you can sort of dilute the appearance of fat. You know, that you makes can, sense. So, a lot of bodybuilders do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so when it comes to like, you, you have a, a shoot, say, in six weeks, right? Mm -hmm. How much cardio are you going to do for that, or are you just going to do your, your training and then you know keto and inter inter intermittent fasting? Like, do you ramp up cardio to, to target fat loss personally? Yeah. Personally, I do. So I know a lot of people that uh, go into like a, any kind of cutting cycle or anything like that prior to uh, competition or shoot, they don't do any cardio. Um, yeah. I enjoy cardio, so I mean, I'm a little bit biased. I actually like how I feel. I've always kind of enjoyed it, but I wouldn't say that I ramp it up to the crazy degree. Like, you know, I maybe will do uh, 20 minutes or so in addition to what I would normally do. I always like to go one variable at a time. So if I'm trying to get really, really lean, I go as far as I can go with the diet before I feel like I'm restricting calories too much. And then I start implementing cardio and I try not to ever do it in a progressive state because I know what that leads to. Um, you know, I'm of addictive personality to begin with. Like, so I know that like, if I start getting addicted to more and more cardio, I'll do more and more and more. Mm -hmm. And the next thing you know, like that's your, that's your big piece. Like that's, that's what's driving your fat loss. Like, I feel like you can make sort of an executive decision in your fat loss regime right at the very beginning where you say, I'm gonna either do this fat loss regimen with cardio as my main driver or I'm going to do it with nutrition as my main driver and you have to make that decision because I know plenty of people that also eat quite a bit of garbage leading up to like a show but they'll they'll just ramp up the cardio and it's just it's a lot easier to just control your diet than it is to try to outwork a bad diet Great and point. just for time and just efficiency and wanting to you know spend time with your family and not two hours on a stair climber you know that's my goal so it's like I like cardio but I still like I control it very strictly and I do that simply because there's metabolic drivers that I affect when I actually start doing cardio that I think exacerbate the positive effects of my, my diet changes. Yeah, I, you know, I think people have this kind of halo effect where they think that they did an hour of cardio or 90 minutes of cardio so they can, you know, they can have a little bit more wiggle room in their diet and they start to make more poor lifestyle choices and diet choices. Like I used to uh, competitively race bicycles, like, you know, Lance Armstrong, Tour de France style of biking. And I would see some people gain weight as the season went on when they should be losing body fat because they're exercising more, but they would have this like compensatory post-workout yeah. eating, you know, oh, I, I burned so much calories per day so I can afford to have all yeah. this sort of stuff. And yeah. so that's kind of interesting. Um, but I, I want to emphasize, you know, you, you really talk about like, changing one variable at a time. So I think a lot of people are like, okay, I'm fasting now, I'm doing cardio, I'm doing keto. They, they're changing like a lot of stuff all at once. Like, so in your estimation, is it like the, the diet, is that kind of the primary lever that you like to start with and then start manipulating other things over time? Yeah, definitely. So like diet is, I always say like exercise is just a catalyst for the diet to do the rest, right? So it's like, if you control your diet first, it gives you like, you do the most, the least. You, I don't want to say exhaust all your resources because you don't want to push it to the limit with your diet like that. That's just not healthy. But what I do recommend you do is make a change to your diet and give it a little bit of time and let that have an effect because it will have an effect. If you try to throw too many things in at once, it's confusing to track what actually elicited the response. Mm -hmm. If I have a you know client, or let's just say for myself, I were to start 
the keto diet now, and then I also wanted to start a round of supplements, and I also wanted to start some intense training. Two weeks down the road, I might have lost 10 pounds, but I don't honestly know which one did it. So I don't know which one to really amplify. You know, I don't know because everybody, we all live at diff different points in our life. Different things are going to kick us into gear better. You know, like, and there's things that are outside of our control. Like there might be a period of time when I get more of a response from my exercise than I otherwise would. Or the same thing with diet. Like there's times when the keto diet works really, really well for me. And sometimes I'm just not just jiving nearly as much. Mm. So it allows me to fine tune which one's working really well. So if I start on a keto diet and I have moderate success and then I add 10 minutes of cardio into my mix and all of a sudden I'm like, whoa, things are working really, really well. Then I know, okay, well I can increase this cardio and probably have a really enhanced effect because clearly my body's just operating well with that. Right. It gives me the freedom and the flexibility to toy with that. That's such a good point. Um, have you found any differences now that you're fat adapted that cardio is more efficient fasting versus unfasted cardio? Like I know in the bodybuilding space, a lot of people when they're in contest prep will do fasted cardio for like 60 minutes. And then yeah. some people say, I think Stuart Phillips said, you know, he's at McMaster, I believe in Canada. He said, you know, it doesn't really matter. Just get cardio in when you can. Like if you're, if you, if you want to like split hairs, when are you going to perform your cardio? Yeah. I mean, I train fasted all the time, like whether it's weight training or cardio. So I'm a little bit biased with that, but I've definitely found that when I train fasted, it's, it's changed my body like I, people often ask me like what's one tip that you can give like one tip and it's always my one tip to anyone keto intermittent faster whatever or not is train in a fasted state like i get the most metabolic response when i train in a fasted state um, to the point now where i think i'm so fat adapted to that that i actually feel sluggish when i train in a non-fasted state my body feels out of whack it's kind of like it, sometimes to a detriment, right? Because it's sometimes like I actually feel a little bit sluggish after I eat anything. It's like my body just prefers to be in that really clean mm -hmm. um, fat adaptation state. But there's also so much cool science when it comes down to like the intramyocellular lipids and everything like that. Like we have these little teeny like fat droplets basically inside our muscles they're called intramyocellular lipids. And they're recruited when we actually work out, when we move that muscle. And therefore what happens is adipose tissue and everything else gets mobilized to restore those intramyocellular lipids because we always need to have those intramyocellular lipids. It's not like our muscle is always 100% lean. There are, there are little fat droplets in there mm -hmm. and those have to be replaced because they're part of, I almost want to say they're part of like kind of the lubrication system of our muscle. Like there's part of that just allows it to move, but then it's, there's other components too that I think are beyond even the research and all we know is that they're there. And fasted state, I can't remember exactly what it was, but it was, it was something like 14 or 16 times the amount is actually burned intramyocellular lipids when you train in a fasted state versus a non-fasted state. So there's definitely a recruitment of fat that mm. isn't directly involved in the energy creation pathway, but are somehow burned through that process. So that alone is pretty cool. Totally. Um, but then of course, it's just the fat adaptation. Yeah, there's also the side of just you know establishing more mitochondrial density and allowing that, you know, which is therefore in making that whole ATP synthesis and ATP coupling process just that much more efficient because your mitochondria is more efficient. So I think you actually can do some long-term, uh, cause some long-term benefits by actually getting yourself conditioned to training in a fasting state. Yeah, it's like, I feel like it's accelerating that fat adaptation process, right? Because it's, 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 a, it's like a, what do you, like a cardiovascular stress test, right? You're putting the heart mm -hmm. under stress. And I think that is like a mitochondrial stress test when you exercise yeah. fasted. But you, when you and I grew up, you know, reading Flex Magazine or Muscular Development, um, training in a fasted state was a big no-no because you'd torch your muscle, right? Yeah. And so what, what has changed your perspective? Obviously, doing it yourself has changed your mindset, but now we know that ketones are anti-catabolic yeah. and maybe muscle sparing. So can you kind of speak to that? Like, like, are you worried about torching muscle when you train fasted? No, there, there's two myths that come down to the fasted training, and it was my own experience, but also, yeah, just seeing a lot of research that wasn't really applied in the exercise realm, but was applied in other settings that I was able to cross over. and. You know, the, the, the first myth is that like when you do fasted cardio, you are, uh, <laughs> you probably remember this, you're going to slowly deplete your glycogen tank to the point where your body ultimately has no choice but to run on fat. Mm. Okay. Not quite that process. Like you're not like going in and doing low intensity cardio via beta oxidation and utilizing a lot of glycogen. Like okay. it's just not happening. That's just not how it works. So you're not draining your tank. So first, the first thing was like, okay, well, if that's the case, then like you already have like the muscle is not really being recruited to that level. But the other thing is like, yeah, when you are in a fasted state, whether you have a high degree of ketones that are present or not, like you have a lot of different things that are actually somewhat 
muscle sparing. So the presence of ketones, for mm -hmm. sure, spare muscle. So therefore, yeah, you're putting yourself in a great state where your actually body wants to recruit more fat for fuel, so it's perfect. But you also have some other interesting things that go on. Like, for example, uh, people often think that like the various uh, like adrenaline, noradrenaline, things like that, they, they think that those are extremely muscle wasting. But they actually have some unique properties inside the body that under the right situations can actually spare muscle. So like when you're training in a fasted state, you're stressed, for lack of a better term, sure. right? Like you're in that stressed state. So you have a higher level of adrenaline, noradrenaline, and even cortisol to some degree. And it's just like cortisol, all these things have got a bad rap that they're just gonna waste muscle away. Yeah. And they have to be in really pretty unique situations for that to really occur. Um, so learning that and uncovering that I could be in this stressed state and actually it caused more of this lipolysis to occur and more activity at the site of hormone sensitive lipase to really make it all it just really changed how I looked at things. I used to just think of it as like tit for tat, like the second that I start burning fat, I was also burning muscle. And if I didn't have food in the system, that, that was just gonna, everything was gonna enhance. I was gonna burn more fat, but I was also gonna burn more muscle. Mm. So I hope that makes sense. No, it and totally I does. I went a little bit of a tangent with it. No, that's awesome. And I think the important thing to, uh, to emphasize here is I think the more, and this is based upon research and the fasting studies we were talking about on the other video that I'll link below that we did talking about calories in versus uh, calories out, Oliver Owen et al. has shown that like, when people are more fat adapted, they spare more lean muscle mass yeah. in the fasted state. So I think you know, maybe that research would have been true 20, 30 years ago when everyone was doing a lot of high carbs, right? That yeah. if they train fasted, if your body's dependent upon carbohydrates, that potentially you could torch muscle in yeah. a fasted state. But I think you know, we're coming to the point where we're looking at, there's different metabolic phenotypes or flavors. Yeah. And so when you're fat adapted, it's literally like a different metabolic signature. So I think uh, that's a good thing for you all to kind of remember and keep in mind. Um, you were talking about compound movements and lists. You know, we see people go to the gym and they have the exercise, uh, they're doing accessories, right, yeah. as their primary movers. But what have you found with like doing the squat, the deadlift, presses, things like that, compared to like finisher exercises? Yeah, so I have found that through the proper utilization of compound movements that I don't get the same, uh, or I do get the same, well, I shouldn't say the same, but I get a good degree of those auxiliary muscle like recruitment, right? I, mm. I get a good degree of like, if I'm doing rack deadlifts, for example, I get a high degree of my biceps coming into the equation and there's putting them under a pretty serious load, which kind of leads into what we can talk about with that, which is like, the muscle only really understands that it's under tension. Like it's not necessarily understanding like oh, how heavy the load is. It's not really understanding more about the time under the tension and everything like that. So like when you have the muscle under stress and you're able to do that with a compound movement, like with like a rack dead or a full deadlift where you're putting that bicep under a good amount of stress, maybe not a peak contraction. Like I definitely get a good degree of recruitment. Um, if I was trying to build muscle in a specific, like, you know, maybe in my arms or my calves or something like that, it might be a little bit tougher, but for someone that's already has like the physique built and mm -hmm. you're just trying to maintain and maybe get a little bit of growth out of it, I find that I can now resort to compound movements, get the most bang for the buck and still maintain muscle very easily. I haven't pushed myself into like a heavy hypertrophy range or phase with, uh, you know, at Dead this lifts. point in a while. And I haven't done that with compound movements or deadlifts in a long time. It used to just be a part of like kind of the neural adaptation process for me, like mm. where I wanted to expose myself to really heavy extreme weights when I was trying to bulk up so that I could handle them better. But it was never like with the intention of like, I am trying to specifically build a given muscle with this deadlift right now. Right. You know, squats a little bit. I was like trying to build the quads and the glutes, but even with squats, it was like, I just knew that inherently there was a lot of metabolic benefit to doing these big compound movements. Yeah. So. That's a good point. Uh, why do you think people are scared of them? Is it because they think they're gonna get hurt or they don't wanna do them? Does it take a lot of energy? Like, I've, I've wondered that. I think it's a couple things, but yeah, it's getting hurt, but it's also there, people are chasing the pump. Mm. You know, and like when you are moving blood to your entire body because you're doing a deadlift, like the pump isn't the same. You know, unless you have, you know, something else going on where you're gonna get, I used to talk, you know, people used to get lower back pumps all the time. And you talk about people that are using like performance enhancement drugs, like they get crippling lower back pumps when they do deadlifts because they have like a high degree of basically blood flow that really shouldn't be that much, right? So it, I think people are chasing the pump and they're mm. not getting the same out of it. You know, people love to go into those sort of, you know, quote unquote finisher exercises because that's what gives them the pump. You know, that's what is fun for people. And that's what gives them the, I guess you could call it almost an illusion of, of creating muscle. When in reality, it's just it's just a pump. It's just it's just it's driving some nutrients into it, but it's not the ultimate end goal. So it's no fun to go into the gym and hammer out a bunch of deadlifts if strength is not your goal. It's no fun to go into the gym and hammer out a bunch of deadlifts yeah. because you're not going to look in the mirror and see a pump. You know, I think that that's ultimately what we get down to. That's super interesting. Yeah, I mean the. Uh 
I mean, there's many aspects of hypertrophy, right? Like, like getting nutrients to the muscle and getting like under, like maybe doing sets to failure, lightweight, like mm -hmm. that, that can get the pump. But like you said, there's time under tension, there's other drivers. Like in your eyes, what's the biggest driver of hypertrophy from a kind of a, a deep dive molecular? I mean, you were talking like Golgi tendon earlier, the sarcoplasm, yeah. like, um, you know, what, what do you think's driving hypertrophy? I, I'm a believer that it's more just flat out just putting yourself in like that mTOR activation like period. I think that that's everything. I think that other, that's, I think there's different subsets of that that we haven't really talked about a whole lot. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's different levels of hypertrophy. We were talking a little bit before about like, there's the sarcoplasmic hypertrophy where it's like sort of the, uh, all the protein in the water and sort of the gel-like kind of part of the cell where it's like that part can actually grow, but then you can actually have true like muscular density growth, muscular mm -hmm. like really dense growth of myofibrillar level. So, um, a way to reference it, and you're familiar with this, I'm sure, but like you look at like an older person that's maybe 40, 50, that's been lifting for a long time, and, and sure their skin is thinner, so their muscles look denser, but there's like a density to like their muscle that's just so different from like a 25 year old. Yeah. It's like, I mean, and again, we have to, it's tough because everything gets skewed, and I have to be completely transparent with, with like it's very, it's very skewed because you can't look at a 25 year old that's heavily muscled that's on you know, heavy performance enhancement because it's a different story. But if you took two natural individuals, a 25 year old and a 50 year old that have been training for, you know, equal amounts of time, it's, uh, or at least the 50 year old training for a longer period of time, I should say, you're usually gonna find they have a denser level of muscle. Yeah. And it's like the 25 year old might have more of that sarcoplasmic hypertrophy, which is usually kind of the newer hypertrophy, whereas like true muscle density and muscle growth. Um, so it's like when you're chasing the pump, it's like you get that sarcoplasmic hypertrophy. Like you get kind of the swelling and the enlargement of that part of the cell, but that's not really the actual like myofibrillar growth. Does that make sense? Interesting. Yeah, it does. I've never heard anyone break it down like that. That's awesome. So there are some studies out there kind of showing that, uh, you know, time and attention, training methodology, age affects these different aspects of muscular it's, growth. Well, that's actually what's all under debate. So that's what's kind oh. of interesting. So it's like we can link to the one study that we were you know, was kind of talking to, but it's like, it's, it's wild. It's like, it just kind of makes sense when you start applying it, sort of my own hypothesis with it. But the one thing, like when you're talking about the pump specifically, that is a little bit more of like that sarcoplasm. That's like, you are getting more of a pump there. So that makes sense where it's like, if you're, how are you training? Are you training for power? Are you training like heavy where you're not getting as much of a pump and you're not going to see that growth in the sarcoplasmic reticulum kind of area. Mm -hmm. But again, it's all up for debate. And it's, it's, it's a wild world. I think we've barely scratched the surface on like what actually triggers muscle growth. Like I really think, I have come to believe now that it's much more of like just a protein synthesis kind of activation more than anything else. And we have mm. different genetic processes that are going to allow that to occur more in some individuals than others. Um, and I'm kind of resigning to that fact because it's just so difficult to determine what makes someone, like you take two people and they do the exact same training regime right. and they eat the same thing and one person is going to build a bunch of muscle and one person is not. Like, I can't even get started on the genetics because like, that's a whole wild world that I'm not familiar with, but it's mm -hmm. so crazy out there. <laughs> yeah, you no, know it is, right? And I think it can be frustrating for people because they see an influencer on social media that maybe has booty gains that they want. And they do the same exercises and they're like, dude, I did hip thrust, I did deadlifts, and my butt is not growing or my arms aren't growing. And I think yeah. we need to consider like, to, you know, the response. And what I found, my wife and I, through doing intermittent fasting, is like we respond to our exercises better. Like even though we're fasting yeah, yeah. more, it's like, it's not like we're putting on muscle that day, but I found that like, and I don't fast too much, just maybe two, like two 24 hour periods at most a week. Mm -hmm. Usually it's like a 24 to 36 hour fast. Like if I do a workout the next day or even on that day, I'm way stronger than I was like two or three years ago. And I would have thought the exact opposite. Yeah. So it's yeah, pretty it's, interesting. It's definitely interesting. Like I don't, I just, I've seen a nice like balance now, like where like, I'm just, I'm just strong when I'm fasted, period. Like, I don't know if I feel stronger when I'm fasted, but I just, it never, it doesn't, the, the range is so much smaller. It's like when I was training in a fed state, like I could feel like there are some days where I'd feel like ultra weak and some days where I'd feel ultra strong. There's a consistency with training yeah. fasted that I just really like, which makes periodization a lot easier because it means my data tracking, if I do want to get down to actually logging my list and stuff, there's just less variables once again. Like I'm mm -hmm. in a fasted state. Sure, what I ate the night before might matter, but by and large, if you're fasted, you're fasted. If you're 16 hours into a fast in your training, or you're even 12 hours into a fast in your training, what you ate the night before, I would argue, probably doesn't make a huge, huge difference. Right. It might, you know, some things might hurt you more than help you, but I mean, fasted state makes it just nice and like kind of just neutral all the time. More predictable, Yeah, I feel like, yeah. That's awesome. Um, so you have really good arms. Like w genetically, would you say that your arms are like a, a like strong 
point of your body. Because everyone has like, some people have great calves, yeah. delts, whatever. Um, and then what do you do for arms training wise? Yeah. So I mean, nowadays I don't do a whole lot of specific arm training. Uh, I've always been very back dominant. I've always been, had a really strong back. So uh -huh. uh, I think because of my strong back, I think my biceps have always been really well developed. So I think that that's a lot of it, and I continue to you know train hard on back. It's one of my favorite body parts to train, and I feel like I just get a really good workout out of it. So I feel like it's sort of just that you know synergistic muscle group that's just kind of been allowed to grow with that. Um, but a lot of it also just came down to the fact that I think I gave them a lot of attention when I was really overweight, mm. and when I was overweight, and I was probably in a lot more of a state to be able to build muscle. Quite frankly, uh, I gave them a lot of attention. You know, and so I definitely to, again, my detriment. Like I actually think that the size of my arms sometimes plays a role in like almost my mobility and physiological imbalances. Like these mm. actually like, um, so I don't necessarily like. You don't want them to grow. I don't want them to grow. Yeah. So if anything, I don't want them to shrink because they're somewhat of like a part of my brand, right? Like mm. people know me as having big arms, but like I don't, so I don't really want them to shrink, but at the same time, I'm also like a point in my life where it's like, I want to have a little bit more balance to my yeah. life and body. So, you know, nowadays, like I try to keep them updated just with, you know, lots of rows, lots of heavy rows. Uh, I still do a good amount of like rack deadlifts. Don't even do a whole lot of like full deadlifts anymore because mm. it's just like I've had enough injuries doing that before that I'm just not wanting that to happen. Low back uh, or hamstring? Yeah, or? lower back. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah I have had one one hamstring. Injury. You've had a lower back injury? Yeah, it's a yeah. pain. Yeah, it's it's no pun. <laughs> so it's like having a little kid. It's like I don't want to be you know like it's tough in pain picking them up. So you know. Arms, you know, I would give them one dedicated day instead of in like one day a week, but that yeah. dedicated day is usually associated with also like a hit day. So like I'll do my hit, like a hit routine that's going to either be like a hit mobility or just hit cardio focused, and then I'll just polish off my arms a little bit after that. You know, mm. maybe I'll go hit, you know, three, four sets of some concentration curls and some skull crushers just to make sure I'm giving them a little extra attention so they don't atrophy. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's really it nowadays. That's a really good point. Uh, what about whey protein BCAs? Where do you stand on that? Yeah, you know, I used to be a huge fan of BCAs intro workout. But now, obviously, it's a gray area, but the whole leucine thing, and it, it does elicit an insulin response. Sure. So I try to keep you know, BCAs out of my like, pre-workout or intra-workout regime. Uh, a lot of times what I'll do is, if I'm gonna go on like a semi-fast, is after a workout, I'll have BCAAs, but I won't have protein. I see. And I feel like that's at least stopping the catabolic process, but allowing me to be in a, in a calorie deficit still for the rest of the day. Mm -hmm. So that's where I like BCAAs. Um, personally, I have some issues with dairy. I just don't digest it very well, so I'm usually a pea protein guy. Mm. Um, so pea protein, pea, hemp combination, so I can at least get a full amino acid profile. And I seem to have a good response with that. Um, I definitely can put on some more muscle if I use whey, but it comes at the cost of me holding a lot of water, which is hard for what I do being yeah. on camera a lot. It's, yeah. Right, you, because the inflammation associated with that. Exactly. It's, you know, um, so the pea protein, it's interesting. Like I, I kind of cycle through my proteins and mm -hmm. not try to have the same protein all the time. There's some vegan bodybuilders out there who, some of them are really massive. You know, I, do you think some of these guys are able to, number one, can you put on size on a vegan diet, do you think? And then, or have you looked at some of these guys in the industry? Some of them are probably in LA. Or do you think some of these vegan bodybuilders are natural? Well, I think there's, I think some of them, I mean, just with anything, I'm sure there's yeah. some that are and some that aren't. Yeah. Um, you know, it's kind of like, I guess it fits into a vegan profile to use an artificial synthetic hormone. Right, yeah, <laughs> so, no animals I mean, would yeah. right. So, <laughs> I mean, as long as they're not using like bioidentical stuff, I guess, but it's, uh, you're definitely gonna run into that. And yeah. I, I know, because I know a lot of these bodybuilders haven't been, these vegan bodybuilders weren't vegan full time, right? They were, they, they came into like becoming a vegan later in life. So it makes me wonder, it's like, did they establish like sort of the potential to be able to build muscle at a younger, like if you were from day one to just be a vegan and then like, could you build that muscle? I don't know, yeah. you know, because it's like, it's so tough because like once you have a muscle a certain size, like there's different things that can engorge that muscle mm -hmm. and, and make that muscle feel be fuller. And it's like if that same vegan bodybuilder were to stop training and keep their diet the same way, like what would happen to their physique? There's a lot of questions that come to mind with that. I do think that if you know what you're doing, that you can probably put some decent muscle on as a vegan as long as everything is in line, as long as you can manage to get that protein. But it's a pretty complex process to, to get protein in adequately on a, you know, Vegan diet. diet. And I, you probably saw, like, I just did a vegan keto challenge for like two weeks, oh, no. where I went vegan ke vegan keto for two weeks just to yeah. see if it could be done. And um, mentally, I felt amazing. It was a very difficult diet to do. Very yeah. not sustainable for people that aren't experienced with that. But I did it because I wanted to show that it could be done because mm -hmm. the vegan community comes at me a lot because I talk about keto. Right. Um, 
you know, I definitely felt like I lost some muscle. Really? Uh, but I felt good. So, I mean, it depends what your goal is, I suppose. Totally. Yeah. yeah, I mean, if longevity was was a goal, I might be a little bit more plant-based than I am. But yeah. I found, like, my wife and I, we went to Bali, Indonesia for two weeks. And basically, they don't have a lot of protein there. It's like, you know, there's a little chicken from some farms and everything. They do a lot of tofu. So we're like, look, let's just try vegan for a while. And I came back. Everyone was like, dude, you look skinny, man. What's going on? Yeah. Like, everyone said that to me. And we were still eating our same frequency and exercising the same, but I felt like I lost some. Yeah. So mass. So I think it's it's important to know your body type and your goals. And I think you you talk about this a lot. It's personalizing things for you. I think a lot of people follow a guru and do exactly what they do, but they're not the guru metabolically or microbiome and so yeah. forth. Um, good stuff, Thomas. So when were you overweight? Uh, so like 2010, 2009, 2010. So okay. I was like 100 pounds overweight. So I was about wow. 280. Yeah. I've seen those pictures. It's yeah. amazing. So it was, you yeah. know, and I lost the weight pretty quick, probably because I was I was an athlete before, and it was okay. like. I guess the symbols, I mean, it was kind of a bulk gone wrong in a way. It was like I started lifting, I was like, oh, I'm going to put some muscle on, then I just stopped giving a crap. Wow. <laughs> and you were busy with work, right? I was yeah. busy with work, and I was just, I was still lifting and stuff. And that's the thing, I was like, I was like oh, cool, I'm getting strong while I'm building muscle, but I was also just being really fat, too. So yeah. it was uh, <laughs> amazing. And you've been able to keep the weight off. A lot of people don't do that, right? They up and down. And I, you know, full disclaimer, like, I mean, I, I'm pretty honest with this, but I think that, you know, like, I was an endurance athlete growing up mm -hmm. and in high school. So I think that I, like, paved the way for like I you know they always say the genetics load the trigger and uh, or you know your, yeah your genetics load the trigger and your life or sorry yeah your genetics load the gun lifestyle pulls the trigger right right, right. so I think that like I had uh, I think I had decent genetics to begin with and I think that I paved the way with a pretty good lifestyle at a young age where I mm -hmm. probably established a good bit of like fat adaptation and I could look back at my life I didn't eat a whole lot of carbs growing up and I ran a lot yeah. so I think you know just because I don't like to be unrealistic with people I think I had an easier time losing weight than other people might because I had that sort of genetic predisposition to be able to be a little bit thinner, but also like I was an athlete, I knew how to work out. I knew right. how to, you had the foundation there. Yeah, yeah I think that's, it's, it's important. And I think um, some people might view this as like deterministic or something like that. Like if they were overweight, then they're always gonna be overweight. Like, but yeah. it, that's not necessarily the, the case, but, that, but, but your early experiences, like you know, if an overweight child, there's that recidivism where it yeah. stays with people, mm -hmm. but the body's malleable and adapts in real time. And so yeah. there's a ton of people and we talked about in, in the video that we posted on your channel, that uh, when there's different messaging and network biology going on when you're fasting or on a ketogenic diet that can potentially help to overcome some yeah. of these um, you know, years of lifestyle aberration. So I totally. uh, just want to thank you for coming on the channel. Yeah. I think as, when I got to like 30,000 subscribers, like like you're always like reference right there. Like our channels are similar. Like yeah. a lot of people uh, on my channel love your channel as well. So it's cool to collab with totally. you. Totally. Um, what's one of the things like, uh, just as like a final parting question, like if, if, what's the biggest thing you've learned through like your health quest, right? Where you're like, I wish 20 years ago I would have known this. Like if there's one thing, maybe it's enhancing your sleep, 10 minute walks after you eat, like what's one thing that you wish, like, dude, I wish I would have known this 20 years yeah, ago. Yeah, uh, mobility. Yeah. For sure. Yeah, mobility and just um, probably learning that with mobility comes strength and now I'm paying the price a little bit for that where I'm less mobile and I think my strength suffers because of it. And if I just, I, so if I had to put more focus into that and just, just get out and get moving rather than thinking everything in a linear fashion, like regimented workout here, regimented this, like just get out, get moving, like do yeah. body weight stuff and not be such a slave to this, that linear fashion. Right. Yeah. yeah. Are you doing yoga now for that or Pilates? I, really do or? Yoga. I try to like just incorporate it all into, into my movement. So I don't do any like, specific yoga or specific Pilates, but like I'll, in my hip workouts, I try to work through a range of motion or I incorporate mobility into a circuit, mm. you know, so it's like, it's going to be bear crawls or sometimes I'll even literally in throughout my circuits, I'll, I'll foam roll into specific, you know, um, different kinds of stretching and things like that that are actually incorporated into my workout. So I feel like I'm really working a full range. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, so final question here. We have a lot of healthcare practitioners, nutritionists, like coaches and stuff that listen to this, particularly in iTunes. Uh, and a lot of folks now want to grow their businesses with YouTube and Instagram and all mm -hmm. that. And like at the time of recording this, I think you're at 1.4 million subscribers are very close to it on YouTube. Um, hundreds of thousands on Instagram. What's one tip that you'd offer for, uh, for an aspiring influencer that wants to get into social media, YouTube and all that? Like, would you say pick one channel, just be consistent with the content? Like what's one thing that you yeah, would? Yeah, I mean, it's kind of actually, it's both. It's, it's pick your one channel and be consistent with it and just be consistent with that. Like if just keep on pumping it out and just keep on, and it's gonna be tough and the algorithms like work against us now, but you just, you just keep going and also just rest and keep it like rest easy knowing that not every piece of your content is gonna take off. Mm -hmm. One out of 10 is gonna take off. 
So just remember that, you know, because otherwise you're going to... Even spit. that happens to you now. Oh my gosh, yeah. No. Yeah, Do you sometimes you think like this video is going to crush it and then it doesn't and you're like, what happened? Yeah, all, yeah. The, all the time. Yep. So, so the algorithm is, is manipulating things even if the content is amazing. Yeah, you get pigeonholed into your given, like your given subject matter expertise, right? So it's yeah. like if I go outside of the realm of keto and fasting, like YouTube just doesn't like to serve a lot of my content because they're like, nah, that's not going to garner as many views. We want, they want the views. They want the watch time because they want the advertisements on there. So, oh man, yeah. that really helps explain some things. I did a video on like Wi-Fi and uh, cell phone things and it was a dog. Like, so yeah. if, I, if I change too much from like metabolic stuff, it, it does yeah. that. Yeah. You Interesting. Got to ease into it, kind of weave it. Like you just got to talk about like Wi-Fi is relation to fat loss, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, whatever. However yeah. you can bridge the gap to start opening that doorway to start talking about that. So funny, man. Yeah. All right, so if someone's listening to this right now or they're, they're driving their car, listening in iTunes and they want to connect with you, do you have programs and things for people? And yeah, the uh, simplest place to start is just go to thomasdelauer.com. Okay. And that's just yeah, simple, that's where they can find me and then of course my YouTube channel. Yeah, what's yeah. your favorite video? That I that, that they, Yeah, on your channel where people should. If they're, if they're keto focused, so two videos, keto focused, then uh, that complete guide to the ketogenic diet, that one video, I mean, you type in keto diet and I think it ranks number one or two on YouTube nice. anyway, but then also the complete guide to intermittent fasting. I did like really long form, very detailed videos on that. So that's perfect information for people that are just looking to get started so in that cool. world. Buddy, thanks for coming on the show. Sure. Really appreciate Thank it, guys. You. So I'll put links to the studies we talked about, Thomas's channel as well, and the website. So very much appreciate you all tuning in. I'm sure you enjoyed this video. So if you did, please hit that like button. And if you haven't yet subscribed, please do so as well.